Hey everybody, I'm Alicia Purdy, publisher of The Way of the Worshipper. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm reading the Bible through in a year. Today is day 239 of our Bible in a year, a reading plan. I'm really glad that you're with me today. I don't know about you, but I need God's word today. Every day I do. And I'm so glad that this is the year that I've chosen to read God's word in a year. How do you feel? Do you feel like you have you made it this far? If today is not day 239 for you, go back, fill in the gaps, go back to day one, start it. Don't wait for Monday. Don't wait for January 1st just get started. I've constructed the plan so that you could read it however you want. Just keep going forward. You can listen to several at a time. You could put one on the morning, one at night, start your day listening to God's word. Sometimes we do a little processing through some of the choppy things that we read in God's word. This is how believers get strong. We are stronger together. That's the whole principle of the two or three are gathered in his name. I'm glad that you're here every single day of this year. So far that I've read God's word, I have su seen such wonderful things from God's word. It's new. It's fresh. I'm not who I was. Same thing with you as you're looking into God's word. You're not who you were a year ago, even if you read it last year or the year before. We're different now than we were then. So there's new things God wants to show us on our journeys. I think that's fantastic. Anyway, check out the resources I have linked below for continued study. The way of the worshiper.com has journalism style devotional blog articles where I dig deeper into God's word and continue to piece those narratives together using my journalism technique as I approach the study of the Bible for myself as well. So those are linked below as they come up topically in the things that we're reading. Also, I have a reflection sheet that's linked there as well. You can print it out, tuck it in your Bible, use it at a Bible study, talk about it with your friends. This is how believers advance the kingdom of God. Hit thumbs up underneath this video. This is how you log it into your YouTube library so that you can make sure you've got all 365 days as you go along. You didn't miss any days. And you and I advance the gospel together online that way. This is how you help ministries like the way of the worshiper continue to push the gospel into those algorithms online. God knows all about that. He understands there's a YouTube out there and that we're all trying to work for it. And he understands that when believers can tap like on a button or subscribe to a channel or leave a comment below, God gets it. And his word still goes forth, even on the digital airwaves and does not return void. It still accomplishes what he sent it to do. Yes and amen. All right, let's open with a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. And thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. We lift our hands to you in worship and praise, Lord, and an invitation. Come and have your way, Father. We we open our ears, open our hearts. We invite you to do that for us and to us, Father. What is it you want to show us? Bring revelation. We need transformation and sanctification through your word. You are the great king above all gods. We acknowledge you first as worthy of praise. We trust you, Lord. We mix this word with our faith today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, here we go. Getting into the book of Job. So now we've been reading the book of Job for a couple of days. It's been very interesting. We saw such beautiful words out of Job. I love the insider tips and the insider perspectives that we get in this book. Job is so raw and so real. We don't get that very often. That's why I really liked Nehemiah. I like the way Nehemiah was written when we were reading that as well. He had this journalism style where it felt like he was writing. We were reading part of his personal journal. I like that. I love knowing that these were real human beings who went through such difficulties. And yet what was going on in their heads? We don't get that very often. So in Job, we see a lot of difficult things. Job accuses God of like abandoning him, of victimizing him. He shakes his fist at God. He's like, why did you even make me? I hate my life. I hate everything about myself. I, this, you did this to me. You gutted me. You've stolen from me. He says these really terrible things to God. But that's actually okay. That's where we bring it. We bring it to God. God already knows what you're going through. God already knows what you're thinking. You might as well just acknowledge it and confess it to him then he can work with it when you give it to him and you no longer hold it to yourself. Plus he already knows. So keep that in mind. You're not hiding anything from him anyway. Empty yourself and let God fill you. That's what I get out of the book of Job. I read it and I love seeing what's in his heart. It's not always good, but I love seeing it. And then yesterday, the last things that we were reading was Job was saying, inscribe this in a rock. I wish I could write this in a book. I wish I had a pen made of iron and I could scratch this into some stone. 
And here's what he said. I know my Redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last. He was speaking prophetically. He didn't know of Jesus in the Old Testament. Jesus, the Messiah is concealed. And in the New Testament and New Covenant, he's revealed. We found him even in the book of Job. He said, and he's, we've seen him several all the times. He says, who will be the mediator for me? He's talking about Jesus. He doesn't know, but you and I do. He says, who will argue my case for me? That's Jesus, the broker of a better covenant. So here we are. He will stand at last on the earth. He's talking about the feet of Jesus Christ. Woo. All right. So today we're going to read Job 20, 21 and 22. He has these horrible friends who keep reminding him who first accused him. Then they implied he did something wrong. They were like, if you didn't do anything wrong, God would not have punished you, Job. Then they're trying to like condescendingly guide him. Like God is, they're like passively indirectly accusing him saying like, Job, God does punish the wicked. And clearly what you're going through seems to be a punishment. You must have done something. And Job keeps pushing back. Like, yeah, my life is horrible and I hate everything I'm going through and I'm accusing God. And then he brings himself back around to his faith because remember in Job 1, on the worst day of his life, when he found out everything was gone, everything was gone. He ripped his clothes and shaved off his head and fell on the ground and worshiped the Lord and said, blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't understand what I'm going through. I hate what it feels like, but I will not turn my back on God. What an inspiration that is. So now we're picking it up where Zophar, his not so friendly friend, has some words for Job as well. Job just got done saying, you better know there's a judgment for the things that you're saying. Then Zophar, the Namathite, answered. Therefore, my thoughts cause me to answer, and for this I make haste. I have heard the rebuke that disgraces me, and the spirit of my understanding causes me to answer. Do you not know this of old, since man was placed on the earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment? Though his loftiness extends to the heavens and his head reaches to the clouds, yet he will perish forever like his own excrement. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? He will fly away like a dream and will not be found. Yes, he will be chased away as a vision of the night. The eye that saw him will see him no more, nor will his place behold him any more. His children will seek favor from the poor and his hands will give back his wealth. His bones are full of his youthful vigor, but it will lie down with him in the dust. Though evil is sweet in his mouth, and he hides it under his tongue, though he spares it and does not forsake it, but keeps it in his mouth, yet his food in his stomach turns sour, and it becomes the venom of cobras within him. He has swallowed down riches, and he will vomit them up again. God will cast them out of his belly. He will suck the poison of cobras. The viper's tongue will slay him. He will not see the streams, the rivers, the brooks of honey and butter. He will give back the produce of labor and will not swallow it down. According to his wealth, the restitution will be, and he will not rejoice in it because he has oppressed the first and forsaken the poor. He has violently taken away a house that he did not build. Because he knows no quietness in his belly, he will not save anything he desired. Nothing is left for him to eat, therefore his prosperity will not endure in his self-sufficiency. He will be in distress. Every hand of misery will come upon him. When he is about to fill his belly, God will cast the fury of his wrath on him, and it will rain on him while he is eating. He will flee from the iron weapon. A bronze bow will pierce him through. It is drawn and comes out of the body. Yes, the glittering point comes out of his gall. Terrors are upon him. Total darkness is stored up for his treasures. An unfanned fire will consume him. What is left in his tent will be consumed. The heavens will reveal his iniquity, and the earth will rise up against him. The increase of his house will depart, and his goods will flow away in the day of his wrath. This is the wicked man's portion from God, and the inheritance appointed to him by God. Now we're in Job 21, acknowledging, yes, we do see bad things happen and the wicked do prosper. Job is speaking now. Job answered, listen 
carefully to my speech, and let this be your consolation. Bear with me that I may speak, and after I have spoken, mock on. As for me, is my complaint against man? And if it were so, why should not my spirit be troubled? Look at me and be astonished, and put your hand over your mouth. Even when I remember I am afraid and trembling takes hold of my body, why do the wicked live and become old? Yes, become mighty in power. Their descendants are established with them in their sight and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, nor is the rod of God upon them. Their bulls breed without failure. Their cows give calves without miscarriage. They send forth their little ones like a flock and their children dance. They take up the tambourine and harp and rejoice at the sound of the flute. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to Sheol. Therefore, they say to God, depart from us, for we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit do we have if we pray to him? Indeed, their prosperity is not in their hand. The counsel of the wicked is far from me. How often is the lamp of the wicked put out? How often does their destruction come upon them and the sorrows God distributes in his anger? They're like the straw before the wind, like the chaff that a storm carries away. God stores up their iniquity for their children. Let him reward the people themselves and they will know it. Let their eyes see their own destruction and let them drink of the wrath of the Almighty. For what do they care about their households after them when the number of their months is cut off? Can anyone teach God knowledge? since he judges those who are on high? One dies in his full strength, being wholly at ease and secure. His pails are full of milk, and the marrow of his bones is moist. Another dies in the bitterness of his soul, never having eaten with pleasure. They will lie down alike, and the dust and worms will cover them. Behold, I know your thoughts, and the schemes with which you would wrong me. For you say, where is the house of the prince, and where are the dwelling places of the wicked? Have you not asked them who travel the road? And do you not know their signs? For the wicked are reserved for the day of destruction. They will be brought down forth on the day of wrath. Who will declare his way to his face? And who will repay him for what he has done? Yet will he be brought to the grave and will remain in the tomb? The clods of the valley will be sweet unto him, and everyone will follow him as countless have gone before. How then can you comfort me with emptiness, since deceit remains in your answers? Now we're in Job 22. Eliphaz, another not-so-friendly friend, accusing Job again. These people keep kicking Job when he's down. But you know what's keeping Job strong and in fighting shape, even though he's covered in boils? His children are dead. He's lost all of his house, all of his camels, all of his wealth is gone. His wife told him to curse God and die. Although, as you know, if you've been watching the last couple of days, we give Job's wife a little pass. She also lost 10 children that she gave birth to. She's grieving as well. And sometimes we say things in our grief we don't want recorded in the Bible for all time and eternity. So Job now, what's bearing him up is he has a genuine faith in the Lord. Before This is all taking place before the Mosaic law. Like Abraham, Job was worshiping from his heart. No one told him he had to. He loved God and everything he gave was willing. This is a man who loves God, but he's on a re- going through a really dark valley right now. Eliphaz speaks about Job's wickedness being great. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered, Can a man be profitable to God as he who is wise may be profitable to himself? Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that you are righteous? Or is it gain to him that you make your way blameless? Is it because of your fear of him that he corrects you and enters into judgment with you? Is not your wickedness great and your iniquity infinite? For you have taken a pledge from your brother for nothing and stripped the naked of their clothing. You have not given water to the weary to drink, and you have withheld bread from the hungry. But as for the mighty man, he possessed the earth, and the honorable man lived in it. You have sent widows away empty. And the strength of the fatherless was crushed, therefore snares are all around you. And sudden fear troubles you, or darkness, so that you cannot see, and an abundance of waters cover you. Is not God in the height of heavens? And see the height of the stars, how high they are, 
and you say, what does God know? Can he judge through the dark cloud? Thick clouds are his covering, so he cannot see. He walks above the circle of heaven. Will you keep to the old way that wicked men have trod? They were cut down before their time. Their foundations were swept away by a flood. Ooh, we know what flood he's talking about. The great global flood, the total reset. Even they know. So we know this is a post-flood account. Here we go. The foundations that were swept away by a flood. They said to God, depart from us. And what can the Almighty do to us? And he filled their houses with good things. But the counsel of the wicked is far from me. The righteous see it and are glad, and the innocent laugh them to scorn, saying, Surely our adversaries are cut down, and the fire consumes their remnant. Now acquaint yourself with him and be at peace. Thereby good will come to you. Receive, I pray, the teaching from his mouth, and lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be built up. You will put away iniquity far from your tents. Then you will lay up gold as dust and the gold of Ophir as the stones of the brook. Yes, the Almighty will be your gold and your precious silver. For then you will delight yourself in the Almighty and he will lift your face up unto God. You will make your prayer to him and he will hear you and you will pay your vows. You will also declare a matter and it will be established to you. The light will shine upon your own ways. When men are cast down and you say, there is a time of exaltation, then he will save a humble person. He will even deliver one who is not innocent. He will be delivered by the purity of your hands. That's the end of our reading in the Old Testament. We're going to stop there in Job. What nasty friends he has. This is why we must have godly friends in these dark times. We're all going to walk through a dark valley. We're not alone. Yeah, God's with us, but we need other believers. It's one of the weapons that we have to fight spiritual battles. We just read in 1 Corinthians a couple of days ago when Paul said, bad company corrupts good morals. This is bad company. Poor Job. More to come. Let's go over and read in the New Testament. Reading today, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. So we finished 1 Corinthians, which was pretty authoritative in the livable doctrines that was a, he, Paul was very disciplinary in the way that he wrote and spoke to the first to the first time to the Corinthian church and they were very grieved so about a year later he writes second Corinthians to bring them the comfort after we know that whom the lord loves he chastens spare the rod spoil the child like the bible says so paul is given a more restorative way that he speaks when he writes this letter to the church in Corinth, because before they were talking about sexual immorality in the church, gluttony over the Lord's Supper, like with the wine and bread, gluttony. He was talking about the way that there are diversities of spiritual gifts, but everyone was criticizing each other. They were pulling up spiritual resumes. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. And Paul was saying things like, don't make me talk to you when I come there. And so at the very end, we see that he is on his way. So now here we are in 2 Corinthians. We're just going to read verses 1 through 11. It has a much different sense, but it's great to read the, the two together. So you realize what was happening and kind of how it's resolving. Great epistles to read when you're, especially when you're looking at the way that sometimes you get can get dismayed at the way the church unfolds today. It feels like Wow, the church is so carnal these days. I grew up in the ministry, and I've been hearing people say that my entire life. Oh, it's so carnal. It's worse now than it ever was. Well, really, it wasn't. That's what 1 Corinthians is showing us. So now let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 1, 1 through 11. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in Acacia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble by the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God, as the sufferings of Christ abound in us. So our consolation also abounds through Christ if we are afflicted. It's for your consolation and salvation, which is effective in enduring the same sufferings, which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Our hope for you is steadfast knowing that as you partake in the sufferings, so also you will partake 
in the consolation. That sounds like Job in a nutshell, suffering and consolation. Paul would have had access to the to the books. He had books access to the books of the law. He would have had access to all of these things that he understands. The human equation is that in this world, we will have tribulation. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So consolation and suffering. For we would not, brothers, have you ignorant of our troubles, which came to us in Asia? We were pressured beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. We had the sentence of death in ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. He delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us. In him we trust that he will still deliver us as you help together by praying for us so that thanks may be given by, by many on our behalf for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons. Okay, we're going to stop there. That's the introduction to the book of Second Corinthians. Paul had just said over in First Corinthians that uh, we had read that famous scripture that people often misunderstand saying, oh, God would never give me more than I can bear. It's not true. It isn't. Because what the essence of that scripture is that, first of all, the enemy never made you promise. He will definitely give you more than you can bear. And second of all, in context, it's talking about temptation. You will not be tempted by anything not even despair or anger or unforgiveness or bitterness or sexual immorality, which is what Paul's talking about, because he makes a way of escape. And there's always a choice to take that way of escape. And that reminds me of what Paul just said here. We were pressured beyond measure and above strength, so more than they could bear, so that they despaired even of their lives, but it led them to put their trust in the God who raises the dead. Yes and amen. All right, let's finish up with a Psalm and a Proverb. Reading today, Psalm 40, verses 11 through 17. That'll finish up the chapter. I love Psalm 40. Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3 are a life scripture for me. It's the thing I write at the bottom every time I write my name. I always write Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3, because I have a testimony, and so do you. God has put a new song in your mouth. I'm sure you will carry many testimonies in your heart of things God has done. A hymn of praise that will many will see. You just got to sing it out. Speak it out. Many will see in fear and will put their trust in the Lord. That's such a beautiful thing. I just carry it with me. God has done so much for me in my life, and I know he's done the same for you. So take a look at the resources I have linked below about praise. Tehila is what David is talking about here. One of the seven Hebrew words for praise. It's the new song. It's unique to you. And it's the only form of praise that God talks about in the possessive. My praise, he says, I will not give to another. These people I formed for myself, they were formed to praise me, to Tehila me, Isaiah 43, 21. And then I love an, another anchor scripture for the way of the worshiper is Psalm 40, verse uh, verse seven, behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. The entire Bible is the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's reiterated again in Hebrews 10. This is the testimony of Jesus. We saw him in Job. Okay, here we are in verses 11 through 17. Do not withhold your compassion from me, O Lord. May your loving kindness and your truth always guard me for innumerable evils have surrounded me. There it is. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I'm not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head so that my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. May those seeking to snatch away my life be ashamed and confounded altogether. May those who desire my harm be driven backwards and dishonored. May those who say to me, aha, aha, be appalled on account of their shame. May all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks about me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay. Oh, my God. That's the end of a reading in the book of Psalms. Check that out. Psalm 40. He has put a new song in your mouth, a hymn of praise to God, and his eyes are on you. He's your help. He's your deliverer. Maybe you feel poor and needy, yet the Lord, he thinks about you. Okay, let's finish up with our proverb reading today. Proverbs 22, verses two through four. The rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. We just saw that over in Job. That's a pretty interesting through line. A prudent man foresees the evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. By humility, 
and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. That's it. Day 239 is done. Hit the thumbs up button if you didn't already do that. Check out the resources below. If you're not a subscriber to the Way of the Worshipper, would you tap the subscribe button and join the community of worshipers seeking the Lord in his word? I'm Alicia Purdy, the publisher of the Way of the Worshipper. Let's close with a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for the reading of your word. We're so grateful to you, Lord. I know that I often feel poor and needy, and I take such comfort, Lord. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we take such comfort knowing that you think of us, Lord. Who are we that you are mindful of us? Father, we thank you that when life is bad and hard, we can run to a good God. You are full of compassion and grace and mercy, not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to everlasting life. What a good father you are. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for the comforter, our Holy Spirit. Lord, we love you and you are worthy of praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.